Well, the news on COVID has been moving so quickly, and I know many of you have lots of questions. And take a look who we have tonight to answer some of them. Not one, not two, but three infectious disease experts, Dr. Lenora Saxinger, Dr. Isaac Bogosh, and Dr. Susie Hoda. Welcome to all of you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Lots of questions from viewers. Let's start with this one from Daniel. Why are we increasing the restrictions on public gatherings in restaurants and gyms and public sports arenas when the only people that can enter those venues are fully vaccinated? Wasn't the idea that if we take all the unvaccinated people away from those venues and those locations, that everybody inside should be safe? Dr. Bogosh? Yeah, so this gentleman has an excellent point. That certainly was the idea. And with prior variants, we knew that vaccines would reduce, but not eliminate the risk that people would get infected and reduce, but not eliminate the risk that people who are vaccinated could transmit this infection. Uh, Omicron has clearly changed things. I mean, this is a very transmissible variant. Uh, we know people with two doses and even three doses of the vaccine are getting infected. We know that two doses of a vaccine will provide some better protection and three doses will provide even more protection against severe illness than two doses. But the key message from all the public health leaders is by reducing capacity, you can actually hopefully slow the spread of this and buy us a bit of time so you can boost third dose campaigns, first and second dose campaigns, get the hospitals ready for this wave that's brewing. And that's the real key message. It's to slow, not stop this wave. One of the key questions people have about Omicron is its severity. And here's a question on that from Sarah. I have a question about the impact of Omicron. What are we seeing as far as severe cases? Uh, how does vaccination help with that? Dr. Hoda? So I think this is still really unclear. We don't know how severe the infections are with Omicron. And early on, we were hearing that in South Africa, it seemed like there's less severe illness. But I don't know that that's playing out everywhere. So I think it's early days. The good news is even two doses of vaccine probably protects us reasonably well, if not has uh, you know very strong protection against severe illness. So we estimate right now that it's probably about 70% effective at reducing hospitalizations, ICU admissions, and a third dose can probably boost that up even higher. So I think it's really important to focus on that as a risk uh, reduction measure. And remember that you know if cases start to rise uncontrolled in the environment around us, the risk of severe infections uh, will increase just by virtue of numbers, right? Like just the number of cases we'll have to deal with. And our health system may not be able to cope with that. So, so that's why the concern is that, you know, with so many cases of Omicron, we might end up seeing more hospitalizations and ICU admissions. All right, Dr. Hoda, thank you. Our next uh, viewer question is from Julie. I am part of the double AstraZeneca cohort and I have had a Pfizer booster since. My question is how that combination holds up against Omicron compared to someone who has had three mRNA vaccines. Dr. Saxinger? You know, this is an interesting and uh, relevant question for that cohort. And I've only seen data on AstraZeneca boosted with one dose Pfizer. And in that data, it's kind of promising because that combination seemed to have some, you know, cross neutralization or effectiveness against Omicron comparable to that of two-dose Pfizer. Now, that's still reduced from what we want it to be. Um, and it is possible but unknown that, you know, two AstraZeneca plus one Pfizer might actually be as good as, uh, as a third dose of Pfizer. But we really don't know that yet. Um, we will be following this data very closely, though, because, you know, the third dose timing and um, priorities are going to be informed by this type of study. Our next viewer question is from Irvin. For people who are vaccinated, what are the outcomes of testing positive for Omicron? Are we ending up with the flu-like symptoms or are we ending up on ventilators? Dr. Bogosh? Yeah, so great point. I think it's fair to say that we should take all the early data with a giant grain of salt because it's early and it's going to change. It's very likely that those with two doses of a vaccine are going to be provided with very significant protection against severe illness, meaning hospitalization, ICU stays, and death. And three doses will very likely provide even better protection against those severe illnesses as well. I'm hesitant to quantify it because it's, the data is going to change over time safe it to say that the vaccines are very likely to keep people out of hospital and keep people from having severe illness. 
Our next viewer question is from Linda. My question is about domestic non-essential travel. Um, I have uh, flights to Vancouver from Toronto return uh, to visit family over Christmas. I've had my booster. What do the physicians advise? I can just sense, Dr. Hoda, a whole bunch of people watching on the edge of their seat now because so many people have plans like that. How would you uh, answer Linda's question? You know, travel is a difficult thing to try and deal with at this moment because so many things are changing all the time. Um, so I guess my advice would be, you know, if, if you do go ahead with travel, recognize the uncertainties that you should be aware of what's happening, you know, in terms of COVID, Omicron, what restrictions are in place and what could change at your destination where you're going. And know that things could change as well and you might need to quarantine if you do have an exposure uh, while away uh, once you come back. But importantly, remember that the process of traveling involves being around a lot of people you don't know and uh, sometimes somewhat uncontrolled situations in the airport. And so it's really important to have a well-fitted mask on, um, one that's a high quality and, and really fits you well to protect yourself and try to distance as much as you can from people while you're kind of waiting. Um, I worry less about the in-flight time, but it's really about those periods when you're around lots of crowds. And we have time for one more question. This one is from Michael. I contracted COVID on November 15th and self-isolated for 10 days. Health Canada told me I could still test positive for COVID for weeks. My question is this, is a rapid test still beneficial to me? Dr. Saxinger? That's a good question. And you know, we know that some people can actually continue to have viral fragments present for quite a long time after infection. And so if you're in a situation where you want to use a rapid test prior to going into a, you know, group situation of any kind and you've been infected within the last six weeks, I would actually suggest doing a baseline test. And um, I, they're less sensitive, so odds are it will be negative. And if it is negative, then you'd be able to rely on a positive. I'd also comment that if you've been recently infected, you might have some partial protection. But so far, the early signs are that infection alone without vaccination really does not protect against Omicron very much. And so caution would be warranted. Rapid tests add a layer of protection, but they don't replace any of the other protections. And definitely people are going to be using them and they should be relying on a positive test, but really actually not relying on a negative test because you could still have infection and still pass infection with a negative rapid test. I can't imagine how much reading the three of you guys are doing, especially in the last couple of weeks. But I do know this. We very much appreciate your time and uh, all of your answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.